Hello everyone and welcome to Tech Unveiled and the fourth episode of our Cloud Rant series. This is a place to be for you who love technology and want to hear our experts share their unique insights and views. My name is Lena Forsberg, I am your host. And in today's episode, we will have a closer look at Midband. And together with two senior Ericsson experts, we will unveil the answer to the question, how do we get the most out of 5G midband in Cloud RAN? Now, let's meet the experts. So with us here today, we have from uh, Product Line 5G, Marie Hogan, our head of mobile broadband and uh, IoT. Welcome. Thank you, Lena. We also have an expert from our uh, Cloud RAN development unit, Oscar Turell, head nice. of technology. Welcome. Nice to be here, yeah, thanks. <laughs> nice to have you. Yeah. So I think no one has missed that today we are talking about midband. But to get us started, Marie, what would you say are the pros and cons of 5G midband compared to other bands and previous generations? Good question, Lena. So for most of the deployments of 5G today, operators rely heavily on 5G midband spectrum to deliver the type of performance that the end users expect. But there are some challenges with the coverage of 5G midband. Wow. When you compare the coverage to, for example, LTE or lower bands for 5G. But we have some tricks up our sleeve Sounds to good. solve those coverage <laughs> issues. And I think the interesting news is that those solutions can run both on cloud infrastructure and also on dedicated infrastructure. So independent of infrastructure, 5G midband will deliver on the benefits that service providers are looking for. Is that correct? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think in today's session, we would like to explore the cloud run infrastructure part of that. But you also mentioned some tricks which caught my attention. Uh, so what are these tricks? Well, we have two main solutions. One we call Uplink Booster and the other we call 5G Carrier Aggregation. And I know in one of the previous Tech Unveil sessions, you discussed Uplink Booster. So maybe I shall take that one first and explain that. And uh, Oscar, you can take the uh, Carrier Aggregation. Yeah, sure. So let me illustrate how this works. I can use my Lego blocks here. So Uplink Booster is an innovative solution to extend the coverage of our midband spectrum. So if we take our massive MIMO radios and we take a protocol stack that would ordinarily re reside in RAN compute or, or baseband, and we consider this as layer three, layer two, and layer one, then what we do is we take part of the layer one processing mm. uh, for the uplink, and we put that in the massive MIMO radio. Mm. And what that does is to move that processing closer to the radio environment and allow instantaneous channel estimation and full uplink receiver rejection. And that enables extended uplink cover coverage up to 10 dB plus, also a better uplink throughput and also the advantage of better spectral efficiency. So all of those, of course, are great things to have with this distribution of the processing. Sounds great. So what about carrier aggregation then, Oscar? I'll, I'll steal uh, Marie's antenna over yeah, here. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so so uh, and uh, we'll turn off the, the uplink booster in mm -hmm. this case so that we have you know the, the pure midband cell. So, so this would be your regular midband cell. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, as we explained before, you know, uh, the uplink being one of the um, uh, pieces that reduce the coverage compared to our low band and LT solutions, uh, what we do is then introduce this carrier aggregation. So, so basically, given that the uplink is, is uh, limited, uh, you know, this poor lady is out of reach. Oh. So, so what we, we do then is we actually move the uplink to the LT band or the, uh, uh, and our low band band all of a sudden, you know, by magic, we sweep this under here and we have increased and she's now in range. So, mm -hmm. so this is the basically, mm -hmm. you know, w one of the concepts of, of carrier aggregation. This could also be called uh, dual connectivity because you are using both systems at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, what we can then additionally do in this context is, you know, 
now we have the uplink in, in the LTE cell. So of course we have relieved some capacity on, on the NR cell, which means that we can use that to even further boost uh, the, the areas that we can cover. So basically by doing that, oh magic, <laughs> and, and now uh, her friend over here is also in coverage. So. So basically what we do then, we move the capacity and, and, and ex extend the coverage even more. So by doing this, we add another two and a half times the area of, of, of the initial and uh, five times uh, the area of, of the original midband band mm. so, so that's coverage, but, but, but you mentioned capacity. What about capacity? Of, of, you know, on cue. <laughs> and, and since I love building Lego box, so here we have your you know bars on your nr phone mm. and and or the capacity uh, so so basically by doing this and and adding this uh, data coverage area and capacity you add another 25% to that mm. great then i think we have a better view of what sets 5g midband apart and also uh, what tricks we have to increase both coverage and capacity so uplink booster and carrier aggregation thanks yeah. What makes 5G midband different from, for example, low band when it comes to a processing perspective? There's quite a large difference in the processing required between low band and mid band spectrum, actually. Mm. So maybe I can illustrate that on the screen yeah, here. Absolutely. I better get out of your way. <laughs> Thanks, Oscar. So if we take a fully loaded low band cell, take away the processing required for the operating system and the processing required for common functions. So we have a fully loaded low band cell, 20 megahertz of spectrum with four layers supported across that spectrum. Let's say that's the equivalent of, of one core for mm -hmm. processing. Then we consider a fully loaded mid band cell, 100 megahertz of spectrum supporting 16 layers across the entire bandwidth. Mm. And then you need to process about 20 times the amount of data wow. for mid band compared to low band. And that is about 16 cores. So that's not commercially viable if you're thinking about pure cloud infrastructure. Mm. But however, if you would add some accelerators to offload certain layer one processing, then you can reduce the number of cores and you need to also keep in mind of future traffic growth and, uh, and future network deployments. Mm. Marie, you mentioned accelerators. What is that? Maybe I can pick this up. Yeah. So, so if you're done here, maybe I can scoot back That's to my chair. Cool. So uh, accelerators, I, I mean, as, as Marie explained here, I mean, the processing that we need to do in midband uh, doesn't really fit into uh, you know, your normal servers if you have, uh, need to have a viable economic situation here. So, so, so basically, what we do with accelerators is we take pieces of the compute that needs to be done on the server and put that to a dedicated hardware that you know, performs uh, uh, more efficiently in, in this context. But what kind of hardware can be used for that then? So, so, I mean, traditionally, uh, uh, Ericsson has, you know, developed uh, our own hardware. So, so we have what we call the ASICs, which is an uh, application-specific integrated circuit. So, of course, you can get the very high efficiency, power efficiency, and, and very efficient compute by building your own hardware, basically, to, to, to do the compute. Uh, so that is one option. Uh, then, of course, it's not as you know versatile. It's it's stuck to what you decided it to be in the beginning. So the other option it would be then taking a, a, an FPGA or a more programmable device uh, that you can change a bit depending on what you what you need to do. Mm. You lose some of the power efficiency, but you still get some programmability that is is uh, stronger. And the third option would be then uh, using a GPU, for instance. And, and a GPU in this context is, is a graphic processing unit, typically used for video coding uh, type deployments. But it's the same type of processing that we do on, on NR with taking uh, big blocks of data and, and crunching those numbers uh, as quickly as possible. So, so of course, that is also a very programmable uh, solution to it, but then it takes uh, a bit more power um, uh, to, to run. 
Well, uh, that's a lot of options. Yeah. How, how do we deal with all of this? I mean, from Ericsson's perspective, I mean, uh, all these options have their benefits. So, so, so of course, uh, one of the ways to, to solve this is you, you have to make sure that your hardware and your software can talk to each other and negotiate what, ca what capabilities are available. And, and I think that's why we are working in Noram, for instance, in, in Workgroup 6, trying to you know, identify how can we have this type of negotiation mechanism so you don't get stuck mm -hmm. in, in your deployments and say, okay, I've picked this type of uh, hardware and, and now I'm stuck with that solution on the software side forever. So, so I think that is one of the clear ways to, to do this. So processing goes up quite a bit in 5G midband and accelerators are then needed to, to deal with this. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Apart from accelerators, what, what other things can service providers do to increase the processing efficiency in cloud infrastructure? Well, one thing we are exploring to improve the efficiency and the performance is to run the cloud containers with Kubernetes on bare metal. And that's as opposed to the more traditional way of running the cloud containers on virtual machines. Wow, that was uh, a lot of new <laughs> expressions for me. Could we break it down a bit? So, so maybe start with you, Oscar. What, what is cloud containers and Kubernetes? So I think, you know, a container is a container uh, than, you know, if you store food or whatever you store in it. But, but basically, in, uh, in our context, I mean, we would be storing our application software. So this would be your typical apps uh, with the interfaces and, and you know, the li libraries needed to run those in, in your software. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you need some sort of manager to handle uh, you know, the different containers uh, and pods, as we call them as the, in, in the Kubernetes uh, environment. And, and Kubernetes then being uh, you know, the open source tool of choice for, for managing your containers. So what is then bare metal? If, if you take the, the traditional way, and I can use this one, mm -hmm. I mean, we have been running this uh, on a virtual machine. So, so basically, what you do in, in a VM context, you not only use your apps and, 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 and the containers, but you also load up your uh, operating system. So, so basically, you have a very isolated system that runs uh, as a virtual machine. So what we do now by taking away the virtual machine, we put the container directly with the manager on top of the host OS and the server hardware. Mm. So yes, it's on bare metal. In our illustration before, it would be on the ship directly. Mm. So, so this then you g would gain a lot of efficiency and capacity as well uh, by doing this. Great. But with that sorted then, wh what type of benefits can service providers get from Kubernetes and bare metal? Well, uh, Ericsson has run some comparisons actually mm. on running cloud containers on bare metal versus virtual machines. And our analysis shows that a total cost of ownership savings of up to 30% can be mm. achieved when running these cloud containers on bare metal. And those savings uh, are applicable in the CapEx and OpEx area in total. Mm. But can you, can you elaborate on the CapEx savings, for example? Yes, of course. So in the CapEx area, there are three main savings. The first one is in the hardware side. So better hardware utilization can lead to a reduction in footprint. Then if we talk about applications, they are more efficient. So we see between a 10 and 20% performance advantage on the bare metal approach versus virtual machines. And then for the third point, you can actually eliminate the virtualization license fee. And of course, that simplifies the cost structure. What about the OPEX? So in the OPEX area, there are also three main savings. Firstly, let's talk about uh, software upgrade. That becomes simpler and more efficient because now you take out this virtual machine layer and mm. the complexity that goes with upgrading that. Secondly, if we talk about the applications, there is a unified competence across applications since the system is now less diverse as such. And finally, last but not least, when it comes to lifecycle management, this is also simplified since the applications can be onboarded in a, in a more standardized manner. Mm -hmm. So three savings in the OPEX area also. 
So Kubernetes on bare metal will bring savings both in CapEx mm -hmm. and in OPEX. That is great news, right? Yeah, Indeed. <laughs> It's been so interesting to discuss this topic with you, uh, but unfortunately, the session is approaching the end. Uh, so to summarize today's discussion, Marie, how would you see that Ericsson can guide service providers to leverage 5G midband in cloud infrastructure? Ericsson can help service providers in this midband journey. We can guide them on how to leverage best the cloud infrastructure, mm offer strategic advice on decision-making around this, and of course, uh, offer our comprehensive and very powerful radio portfolio with our ERS system. When it comes to the cloud infrastructure, we can take advantage of the 5G midband and reduce the t challenges with coverage by using uplink booster and carrier aggregation. And we can also, of course, use our very powerful radios to take advantage of all that mid-band spectrum that is on offer. Mm. And don't forget, TCO, mm. there are great savings to be made when it comes to deploying cloud containers on bare metal. Mm. So I think to summarize, you can say that Ericsson is very well positioned to help our service providers in this space. With those concluding words, I would like to thank you both very much for taking the time and come here and unveil 5G Midband on CloudRAM for us. Thank you. thank you very much. And of course, I also want to thank all of you for watching. For me, it has been a pleasure to discuss this important topic with our experts. And I really do that hope that you found it valuable as well and that you want to further engage with us to discuss what this will mean to you. So this was the fourth episode of the CloudRan series. In our next episode, we will unveil the potential of non-real-time RIC. You'll be surprised how exciting that topic is. So I hope to see you then. Thank you and bye for now.